everyone. Thanks for joining uh, this webinar today on the IA. Uh, we will wait still uh, five, 10 minutes to make sure all the people that registered uh, have the chance to connect. And then we will start uh, with the presentation and the exchanges today. Thank you very much. Please, you can use uh, the chat or the question and answers uh, button to provide comments or questions that you might have on the presentation or what we are discussing. And then uh, if needed, we can also uh, allow some people to, to talk live, uh, depending on the time we have. And uh, if there are people that uh, wants to share experience or ask a question directly by voice. So let's say to start at 11.35 Paris time. I see we are reaching already a critical mass. We have uh, more than 20 participants already connected. We are expecting some more, but uh, I think time asks us to keep going. Actually, we are reaching 30 now, so already a very good uh, number. Uh, anyway, I wanted to make sure you know that this section is uh, recorded. Uh, if you have any problem, let, let us know. Uh, and then uh, a video recording of this will be shared with all of you. So in case you have lost a part of the of the workshop, or if you want to share it with some of your colleagues, you will have uh, uh, you will have the recording for you. But let's start with the quick questions on Mentimeter. Please connect to www.menti.com, as you can see in the slide, and use the code 4894611. So we can start with some questions and answers that you can all see uh, the results on the, um, on the screen. It's quite interesting. We start with a simple one that is, uh, where are you from? And let me share the screen on the Mentimeter slides. You can use your phone or your computer going to menti.com. And uh, the code is the one you see here or in the slide, but you can also see it in the new screen. I'm going to share up in the right side of the screen. As you can see, the first person that answered is uh, from the Philippines. Welcome here from uh, the Philippines, our colleague. And uh, once you start answering, we'll see also where are the other participants from. I'll let you the time because firstly to go to the site and put the code takes a bit of time, but then we'll go quicker for the other uh, questions and answers. We'll need to change the code only once uh, during this presentation. So I think it will be quite quick once you are done. So we can see there, are, there is a participant from Sweden, from the KTH Energy Systems, from Kigali, Kenya, we are from Rwanda. We have a generic from Africa as well. <laughs> I will not answer, but um, I'm based in Paris, but I'm Italian, as you might uh, wonder from my accent. And we have also known today with us that is uh, from Cote d'Ivoire and works at the IA and is based in Paris. Cap Verde, Zambia from the capital. Mozambique, we have already two. Uh, two countries that speak Portuguese. I hope like uh, my accent is understandable also for you today. Maputo, Mozambique, Capo Verde. I'll let you sometimes, so this is the first question. And for the others, everyone will be, will be already set up with the Menti and we can uh, go faster with the other questions. Ghana, that's nice. We have a good representation of Africa. And uh, also we have the Philippines from Asia. That's uh, great. So we can share experience from different continents today. I have two minutes more and then we can go with the next question, actually. Yeah, Ghana. 11. 40, um, one minute we change. So Mo Mozambique is becoming bigger. This means there, are, there is more than, more than one participants uh, that are joining us from Mozambique today. Same from Cap Verde. Okay, let's go to the next uh, question. This is more like a quiz. 
was a bit funny <laughs> how it's done. Uh, I let you answer this question. It is quite simple to understand, I hope. We are just asking what is the number of people without access in Sub-Saharan Africa? You will have three options. Please answer uh, the question. There are eight minutes, but of course, I will. Uh, I will uh, when I see many people answer, I will uh, stop the chronometer. We'll see the answer anyway during the presentation. Eight people already answered. Let's wait for uh, 15. I think there were 15 participants in the Mentimeter. Okay, I think we can let the answer, the Menti pass code for who didn't see it is up here on the, uh, the top of the screen is 489461111. Everyone has, to the monde voted, uh, everyone's voted. So we can see most of people answer correctly. That is 600 million people in Africa today without access to electricity. This is quite high share uh, of the population, as uh, we all know, is almost equally half of the population. Now let's go back to our uh, presentation. Here we are, and let's go to the first slides. So the first slides, uh, it's just about the IA for who doesn't know who we are. We've been funded just after the first oil crisis in 1974. Uh, we are an intergovernment organization uh, that now don't deal only, of course, with oil crisis, but has been funded to keep uh, member countries of the IA uh, in a secure energy environment. This means that, for example, IA members need to keep a stock of their oil demand uh, in their national borders or in uh, friendly countries in order to be able to release this stock if there is an oil crisis and enabling uh, the price of these products to stay more stable and don't fluctuate as much as it could be uh, in an event of crisis. Recently, like uh, during the, uh, the war that is happening uh, and the energy crisis that in 2022, shocked a bit the European uh, markets, especially for gas. They had done some, uh, some work with its members to try to keep uh, the prices to don't fluctuate too much. So as I say, we are an intergovernment organization, and now we cover all fuels from uh, fossil fuels to renewables, energy efficiency, and all technologies. We are based in Paris, uh, we are about 350 people working here, but we are quickly uh, growing. And our main objective is to ensure the world has a secure, affordable, and clean energy supply based on all different uh, energy products and technologies that are available today. One of the most important things we do, as is written here down, is that we provide data that we work uh, with uh, government partners and private sector uh, to provide a global view of the energy sector. So, so we cover all countries in the world. We have energy balances for all of them, but we also go beyond energy balances and we cover other indicators as, for example, access to electricity. And I need to thank most of you that are joining today that always cooperated with the IA in uh, building better access to electricity uh, statistics. 
The IA work uh, in Africa has been expanding recently. We have a partnership with the African Union, UNECA, the African Energy Commission. We have collaboration with the African Development Bank, and we have many countries that are today association and some that will become association soon. For the moment, you have Egypt, Morocco, and South Africa, but you're working with other countries that showed interest to become an association country of the IA. We have been uh, uh, organizing uh, summits with African energy leaders in the past years, as you might have joined, and, and we release many data and analysis and publications that cover the world energy sector, but also the African energy sector, as for example, the Africa Energy Outlook released uh, last year. Uh, let's go to see some results from the World Energy Outlook uh, 2022. We have seen last year analyzing the data and doing some estimation of what was the situation after the COVID crisis and uh, the energy crisis that happened in 2022 on new connections for access to electricity. So we have seen a strong slowdown in many countries on uh, new connections, but also a strong impact on households income that prevented them to be able to connect to new to, uh, to new forms of energy, but also to consume energy by having affected their uh, available, let's say, income uh, for energy. Uh, what you have seen last year, we estimated that in 2022, for the first time in decades, since the IA started uh, at least uh, tracking access to electricity in 2000, we have seen that there's been a rise, most probably, of the number of people without access uh, in the world, to reaching again the levels that were in 2019, in 2022. And this rise happened mostly in Sub-Saharan Africa, as you can see from this graph here. Here we see only before the crisis, but I will soon <laughs> show you what happened uh, according to data and estimations starting from 2020, so when the COVID situation uh, started. And after the COVID, we also estimated that, unfortunately, in Sub-Saharan Africa, after some years of decline that started in 2013, as you can see from this graph, the situation of the number of people without access started to reverse. And again, we have an increase of the population without access in Sub-Saharan Africa since 2020. And we estimated that in the worst case scenario in 2022, the number of people without tax in Sub-Saharan Africa reached again the peak, almost reached the peak of 2013. So we practically erased some years of uh, strong improvements because of the population kept increasing in these years very quickly in the continent and new connections had been unfortunately uh, slowed down quickly. But let's go back uh, to Menti. So we'll keep the same code that we are using before. And uh, you can answer a new question that is related to what we have just seen. Some of you already answered it. This was how the COVID for you has impacted and affected access improvements. And also, how do you expect this will impact uh, 2023? I've seen seven people already answer this, please continue to do it since the most of the people believe or have the feeling that 2020, 2022, 21 was the worst impact uh, on uh, access improvements. Very strong actually in 2020, still very strong in 2021 and 2022. And uh, it seems the feeling for 2023 from these seven people that answer is that the situation is better. The impact is re reducing from what you've seen in the last uh, three years. But I, I give the time to someone else uh, to answer since only seven answer already to this. So it's still menti.com with the same code as before, 48, 94, 61, 11. And uh, let's see what is the feeling that you have on this. On our estimates, of course, is very similar to what we are seeing now from your opinion that 2020, 2021 was very difficult for different reasons, uh, changing priorities of the use of uh, uh, budgets supply chain disruptions that was very difficult to get uh, the material needed for, for example, grid extension, et cetera. And we see like everyone agrees on that. And still 2022, the situation didn't improve because of the energy crisis kept uh, many problems. And also the COVID that still 
was uh, very active in China, that is one of the main suppliers of uh, electrification uh, material, uh, was affecting uh, the supply of these materials. Very, very interesting to see that. If there is someone that wants to share in the chat or uh, later by voice, um, their experience in their countries on uh, the impact of COVID and uh, the energy crisis on their electrification projects, uh, please feel free to do it in the chat now, and maybe we can also take a time to exchange on this uh, interesting uh, and important topic uh, uh, later. So let's go back uh, to the slides. Oop. And as I was saying, please feel free to share your opinion on uh, this impact and what was the most impactful uh, the most impactful uh, effects from the COVID. Okay. Now you are back to the presentation. So let's go to see exactly what we are gonna cover today. What is the agenda? So we'll see what are the objective of the guidebook that we released recently on improving access to electricity statistics that had been shared to you, but we'll share it uh, again soon, if needed, what is uh, what are the key concepts that are in this guidebook and uh, what are the key concepts of improving uh, access to electricity statistics by the use of uh, supply data with one overview of what is the process for tracking uh, uh, access to electricity from the collection of the data to the dissemination or publication of this data. So we'll see all the steps. Uh, in the guidebook is explained much better, but today we some graphics, maybe it will be interesting, uh, uh, will be an interesting experience to, to see. And then we look at the IEA template that we use for data collection. Some of you already know because it's been filled and the data will be submitted. Thank you very much again. And we'll introduce a quick exercise that we would like you to take. Uh, I don't know, uh, today we will not start doing it uh, actively, in your screen, but we'll send you later the Excel files, the solutions of this exercise, so you can practice. This exercise is based on some uh, data that we invented <laughs> for uh, tracking access to electricity, and uh, is based on filling the IA questionnaire uh, with this data then well, that will then provide uh, access to electricity indicators. So let's start so with the objective of the, of the guidebook. The first objective is why, why we start this guidebook. Is that universal access by 2030 is a critical sustainable development goal, as we know, that's DG 7.1, but we are failing behind that, as you've seen in the figures before, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, Well, the situation got worse, unfortunately, because of COVID and uh, the energy crisis. And to accelerate progress, we think that data are the most important tool for starting any electrification planning. So if a country, a government relies on quality data and data that are easily available and timely as on the time, so up to date, their planning efforts will be much better. This data starts from a simple tracking access rates at the national level to having like a jurisdiction village level or GIS, so geographical, that is aggregated uh, data on what is the access uh, situation today. And also we see for planning other additional data are needed, but today we don't focus specifically on this. Uh, as you know, the IEA has been, uh, I don't know if you know Akwale, but we have been the first international organization to produce a global database on electricity access information. We start in the very early 2000 and Akwale uh, in charge of this was uh, our current uh, executive director, Fatih Birol, that was in charge of tracking access to electricity and started this project uh, many years ago, now more than 20 years ago. And today we are official co-custodians for all the SDG7 indicators with the World Bank, the UN, IRENA, and the WHO. 
We just released, uh, as I was saying, the guidebook for improved electricity data statistics. And this uh, is meant to be a guide for government to improve access to electricity indicators by the use of supply side data. What do we mean by supply side data? We'll see better be after, but we mean by using information from energy services providers. So this can be utilities, distribution companies, can be mini grid operators, it can be uh, solar system uh, distributors, or it can be other national institutions that track the supply of uh, electricity in the country. Like for example, an energy regulator that uh, tracks uh, from all the different uh, distribution companies in the country, how many new connections have been done, what are the total residential connections, for example. Using supply data is very accessible and cost effective, so it's ideal for tracking progress on electrification because you can use this data when the system is uh, in place to track even uh, access by month. So uh, knowing last month or even like last week, how many people were connected uh, to the grid or to other kind of systems. And combined with also service, they provide a very high quality and timely estimates of electricity access. We'll see later that Supply side data have many advantages, but also household service have very important advantages. So providing information bottom up from the consumers and the two uh, sources should be used together in a sustainable and uh, a strong data strategy. The guidebook also provide uh, a methodology to, to estimate the access from all grid technologies, namely standalone system or solar system, for example, that are very important and need to play a very important role to achieve uh, universal access in the next uh, coming years, at least for the near term before uh, the electrical grid can reach most of the population. The guidebook has sort of lights how to start using this information for having a geographical disaggregated access information system. For example, we all know that many utilities or distribution companies know which villages they connected, uh, where are the people that paid their bills. So the information is there, but sometimes it's not unfortunately well uh, uh, used. There is not in place a system that permits to uh, track, uh, record, report uh, this data in a way that is uh, easily usable, but the steps to achieve that are not very complicated. Today we will not look this in focus, but we will have other sessions, of course, and other work with uh, our uh, with our uh, partner countries to uh, look at this, at this uh, important uh, geographical disaggregation more in details. Now let's move to the key concepts of uh, access to electricity tracking. First of all, we need to have definitions. What is the definition of access to electricity? The definition of access to electricity is accordingly to what we wrote and has been peer reviewed by many countries and many other organizations that a household has access to electricity when it's connected to a grid or off grid source. And this grid of a grid source needs to be able to provide a minimum level of energy service that needs to be defined. This minimum level of energy service and its definition is very key to then understand which are the systems that can provide access to electricity. So what are the connections and households that can be counted as having access to electricity in uh, the access rates indicators, for example. An example of this is if you have a minimum level of energy services that includes the use, uh, for example, of lighting, a television and a fan, probably the smallest uh, of grid solar system like solar lanterns cannot be included in here. But if you're Definition is a bit different. Some systems could be included. As we see later, I will show you what is the definition that the IA uh, proposing is a guidebook as the first point uh, or the minimum level of energy that can be considered access. And you see the definition is very interesting because also include the fact that uh, the household needs to be able to improve and increase their uh, level of energy. So their consumption, their demand, and their uh, use of electricity services. The access to electricity rate represents the share of the population that benefits from access to electricity as defined before. So it can be calculated as 
the population with taxes divided by the total population. Once when we do that uh, on a top-down approach or from the utility data, for example, on connections, we count how many households are connected today. We need to estimate how many people live in these households, for example, using the household sites data that can be different in different jurisdictions, different uh, states, regions, or uh, areas. And once we multiply these two, we can achieve to understand or to estimate the number of people benefiting from access that divided by the total population bring us to the uh, access rate. So existing data and surveys can help also track uh, uh, the different uh, household sizes, for example. Now let's keep the definitions and uh, let's see how we define the different connection types. Here we define mainly three different connection types. The one is households connected to the main grid. The grid is a network of transmission and distribution lines connected to electricity generators that can be centralized or decentralized. This doesn't matter, but they are connected to this main grid. Then we have mini grids that are small electric uh, systems that comprise a generation unit or units and distribution lines that are linked to households and other consumers. Sometimes mini grids can be connected to the main grid. And when this happens, reporting of the connection must be done to avoid double counting only by the company that is selling to the final consumer. So for example, if a mini grid was operating before in a village and was serving some households and then the grid arrives, the mini grid connects to the grid. If the mini grid operator continue to supply energy as the distributor, uh, the official distributor to the households, we'll count this connection as a mini grid connection. In the case, the grid will take uh, over the business and the mini grid operator will sell, uh, for example, their um, infrastructures, we'll count this now as a grid connection. This is very important to avoid that there is a double counting and we still count this as mini grid, but that's what we are counting as a grid connection. So each connection will be counted by default in our uh, guidelines by the company or by the type of the company that is distributing uh, the electricity directly to the households. And then we have, standalone system that are not connected to any grid and they serve one household only. This can be solar systems, it can be fossil generators or other types of uh, technology that include rechargeable batteries, uh, micro hydro, wind, etc. These things are generally more small. For example, for the off-grid solar systems, we'll have solar home systems that start at 10 watt peak and we'll see later how much energy services can provide. And then we'll have other uh, smaller uh, type of systems. But let's see the IA definition of access. What is the minimum level of energy services that I was mentioning before that the IA consider as access? So here we see on the green, let's say the green, uh, uh, the green bar, we you can see the energy services, lighting for charging, radio, TV, fan, refrigeration. And in the columns, we have put different types of uh, technologies that provide uh, the energy, the electricity service. These are start from grids and large generation sets, mini grids, standalone systems. So for example, we have uh, solar systems bigger than 100 watt peak, standalone system, bigger than 50 watt peak and smaller than 100, et cetera, et cetera. And we can see that each different technology can provide different types of energy services. If we follow uh, the column and what kind of energy services or green bar it touches. For example, a solar lantern or a dry batteries can provide lighting normally. No more than that. While a multi-light system, multi-light solar system can also provide phone charging. So it's a bit bigger, have a bigger uh, photovoltaic panel, a bigger battery, and it can also, besides having some lighting bulbs, can also provide uh, the possibility of recharging your phone. And once we move toward the right of this, uh, of this diagram, we can see that the energy services increase. For example, for our solar on systems of 10 watt peak and more, we can also add to the phone charging, the utilization of a radio, especially 
if the equipments are of uh, high efficiency. When you see the the green bar that becomes uh, with stripes, it means that this is possible. This energy service is possible with this technology if the appliances and devices uses of of high efficiencies. For example, a very high efficient radio, uh, LED lighting bulbs, uh, etc. And this, of course, will evolve as the efficiency of appliances will increase. We can provide the energy service with less electricity consumption and power, so with smaller uh, systems, of course, as we can see from this uh, arrow that we designed. And if you go all to the right, we see the grids, of course, once when they are stable and when they are serving, because in many countries, unfortunately, this is also the problem uh, that the grids are not able to provide and supply electricity all the time and uh, with a good frequency, but, in theory, a grid can provide lighting for charging, radio, TV, a fan, refrigeration, and other larger appliances. As can do mini grids when they are well uh, designed and also large generation sets. Uh, the minimum level that the IA defines as, as uh, first access is a basic bundle of electricity. And this is the one that we see now in, in uh, red in our in our uh, diagram. This includes uh, having lighting, a radio and phone charging. And as you can see, our definitions also implies that the level of service is capable of growing over time for this household. So today is connected with a small solar system that provide this, but the plan is that this household will move up the ladder of energy services gradually and reach more and more energy services as uh, times pass. Then we also define the social bundle to provide also, a, let's say, a target for later. Okay, we can have uh, rich access with the basic bundle, but we want that all households in the country at a certain time will reach higher energy services. So the essential bundle it also include a television and a fan to keep the household uh, cool. There is a definition that is more detailed that de tells you like how many hours per day, the fun, et cetera. But I think we don't need uh, to cover this today. In the guidebook, all the information is done. And that's we have the extended bundle that we also add our refrigerators and larger appliances. This is a, once we reach uh, almost complete level of energy services by the household, and we see that we will need or very big standalone system. So in the villages that are very remote, this will require that the household is equipped with a large solar systems. And today we know there are problems of affordability. So this shouldn't be for all households, the target for tomorrow, but for the day after tomorrow, yes. So in the long term, we need to also keep in mind that we need to be able to grow access level over time. But for counting, and uh, access to electricity, the IA proposes in the guidebook to use the basic bundle. So lighting, phone charging, and a radio to keep informed. It's very important, the service that a radio can provide uh, to people to know the meteo, to know the news, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Uh, and let's move now to the next slide. Let's compare the minimum energy levels with other organization. This uh, column, let's say, in the different colors represent the World Bank multi-tier framework uh, tiers that many of you, I believe, knows. So tier zero is no access, tier one is very basic access, tier two is increased, etc., etc. The World Bank is a very good definition of that. And I use that to put together all the different uh, IA definitions and also some others. As you can see, the World Bank, uh, let's say first access, will be tier one, and this consider uh, very small solar multi-light systems or free watt peak. The IA basic bundle is a bit higher than that, as we have seen before, we want also to include radio in the first access uh, or the minimum level of service defined, but the basic bundle will still fall in the tier one of the World Bank. And we can see also here the essential bundle we've seen before, where we have the television and the fan, it sits in the tier three, and extended bundle of the IA that also includes the refrigerators, it sits between tier three and tier four. 
We know also that several organizations now are advocating for greater ambition in access provision. For example, the modern energy minimum are uh, the, uh, the, the, the organization that's providing that is called Energy for Growth Hub, and they propose the modern energy minimum that is uh, a minimum level of consumption of electricity to provide uh, the increased level of quality of life. This minimum they, they define as 1,000 kilowatt hours per person per year, of which 300 kilowatt hours are for residential use. We can see that this, as compared to the extended bundle of the IA, is not much different. So we are in the same page. The only thing we want to say again here is that this is a very good goal, but should not be the goal of first electrification because many households are not today looking for this very high extended bundle of energy services because they cannot afford neither the energy, the electricity, or the appliances to consume this. So they can start at the basic bundle, but keep in mind that this needs to grow over time. But the important point here is that harmonizing electricity access definition is a very important task that still remains challenging. We see that many countries include different type of connection or different type of definitions in their uh, data they share with us. And uh, we hope the guidebook we publish will help having some harmonization. But what we stress all the time, besides harmonization, is transparency. So once we have metadata and uh, information and documentation that clearly explains how an indicator is calculated, for example, saying uh, our access to electricity rate includes only grid connection, for example, and then there's much more we can say on how it's calculated, what are the sources, this already provide a very transparent information for the data users that uh, are comparing maybe with other countries or they need to know how to better uh, start for electrification planning uh, in the country or a specific uh, region. And let's uh, go to the next slide where we can see the difference of sources for collecting access to literacy data. The one that we cover in the guidebook is supply side data and the other is demand side as we have seen or mentioned before. So supply side data, are the data that are come from distribution companies and, for example, give us the number of residential connection or customers or the consumers that they are supplying electricity with. While demand side data are coming directly from the consumer. In our case, will be from the households and are like most often coming from surveys or censuses where the National Statistics, Statistics Office, for example, ask households if they have an electricity connection, what type of connection, et cetera, and gather directly the information bottom up. But let's see what are the benefits and challenges of both of these sources. Advantages for supply side data sources is that it's less costly, easier to implement because there is no extended household survey to put in place, but you can directly contact the number of companies serving electricity. And so, also the high frequency the data can be available. I can ask the utility, how many people have you connected last month? And if there is a system in place at the utility level, they will be able to tell us. The demand side data source, however, provides also very good advantages. And this is on bottom-up information that permit us to avoid double counting that can come from supply data. We can easy, more easily count off-grid connection and informal connection because directly asking the household, the household will answer you if they have electricity in their place. And ad hoc surveys, so a bit extended surveys like the MTF, for example, can provide also much additional information on how the household is consuming this energy, what is the quality of the energy they are having, et cetera, et cetera. And so this can also be, as you can see in the guidebook we published, some of these indicators additional can also be estimated from supply side data. What are the challenges, however? For supply side data, the challenges are that it's difficult and needs uh, to put in place some connect, uh, corrections, estimation, or discount factors to count for informal connection or sub-metering for off-grid systems and for the use of grid system as backup, for example, because this will be a double counting. If uh, we count as an also that's booked a solar system because the grid is not very stable and we count 
both the sale of this solar system and the grid connection will come this out so as two. So this needs to be taken into account to avoid we are uh, overestimating our access to electricity. What are the challenges of demand science data sources? They are costly and um, they cannot be run every year. So they are run most of, uh, in many cases, between five and 10 years, surveys or censuses. The sample design in remote area areas is complicated to be representative sometimes because remote areas or rural areas in countries are very different depending on the region. So having a representative sample is not very easy, but I'm sure in your country's national statistic office are very uh, prepared for that and can help you uh, in design good surveys. And also there is a subjectivity or the response of the household. When you ask an household if they have uh, electricity, one household can answer yes, for example, if they have just a flashlight. Okay, yes, I have lighting, so they answer yes. While another household will answer yes only if they have a grid connection, for example. So for a service, it's very important to train uh, the, the surveyor, the people that go surveying households and also to provide good information to the households that are responding, so to the respondents. The main message here is that a strong access to electricity tracking strategy needs to combine these two approaches, supply side and demand side data to build on the synergies and the advantages of both of them and mutually reduce the challenges that we have in both of them. For example, the use of supply data reduce the fact that surveys cannot be run every year and so provide a more timely information adding up on surveys. While surveys can provide uh, some more precise information on the number of people that are connected, so avoiding the double counting as I explained uh, before. But let's see a, an example of an access to literacy data strategy that I was saying must rely on the comparability, on the, sorry, on the complementarity of uh, demand side and uh, supply side data, sorry. Let's start with this example. We have a country that, I don't know if you see well, I've seen the thing moving, but <laughs> I, let's see a country that had a survey in 2015. So we can see here on the DS means demand side, so will be the survey data. In 2015, this country, had a survey where they've been counted the number of households that have access to the grid, to mini grid, and to solar systems. The same year, if we look at the supply side data, so coming from the companies, the distributors, we see that there are many differences actually. For example, we had uh, 3.6 million people connected to the grid, while the survey says that there are 3.1. Who is correct or who is not? This is another question, but it's very important to keep in mind that Surveys, if they are representative, can provide a very good information to avoid, like, for example, or to take into account informal connection, informal connection submetering. And the supply side data normally for grid access are, should be also very good. But we see in many countries that there are issues, for example, on the number of meters that are serving multiple households. Or in some countries, we also heard that one household could have more than one meter. This is what quite surprising, but is happening in some countries uh, that works with us on tracking access to electricity. So you can see there is a difference here. So what we can do is calibrating our supply side data on the surveys or censuses results to avoid the double counting, the connection that we missed, etc. But we need to ensure that the survey is representative. Then what happens in the next years? We don't have any more surveys or censuses till 2021. And so we need to rely on supply side data from our uh, distribution companies. As you can see, like the data in 2016 has been in this example calibrated based on the census that happened in 2015. So we have a, a correction compared to the number we had in 2015. This something is happening in many countries today. Uh, I believe some of you are here connected today. We exchanged about this exact problem that a survey that just happened or a census are providing new information that will require correcting and calibrating our data for the years to come. So for the years to come, till the next survey is done, supply side data will provide 
very good information and we can continue track our grid, mini grid and solar system or off grid connections. As we can see from here. And then you see this country in 2022 as another survey or another census. And we again have a new information that can then calibrate again our uh, supply side data for the years after, to, for example, 2023. But also we can, this is very important when possible, correct if needed our historic time series, at least going back some years to be sure we are having a good continuity in the data and analysts and data users will be able to use this data for their analysis in trends. So survey census can also help recalibrate historic uh, data. And now let's move to the overview of the complete data process. First, looking at what are the fundamentals to set up a sustainable and functioning and efficient access to electricity data strategy. The first, uh, let's say, fundamental is identifying all key stakeholders that work on data. This is not only the data providers like the utilities, the mini grid operators, the energy regulator, uh, other agencies in the government, but also data users. So what are the main data users that we can and we want to put uh, in the discussion, to include in the discussion, this can be policymakers, planners, energy modelers in your ministry, or they can be from other ministries or other uh, government agencies, of course, but can also be from external agencies as uh, uh, donors that are present in your countries that help you working on uh, electrification planning. If they're also included in the discussion data, in the data discussion, they can provide uh, uh, help in uh, highlighting, identifying what are the data needs. Because before starting any strategy, we need to know what are the data we want to collect and what are the data the data users need. So once all these key stakeholders, data providers, data users are identified, it's very fundamental to establish a data working group that will meet periodically to discuss on the data needs, on challenges, on a timeline, like for example, when data needs to be provided, submitted, et cetera, et cetera. Provide us organize uh, training for uh, data providers, et cetera, et cetera, and training also to data users for use this data. The second, the second uh, principle is the legal foundation. This is key to have strong legal foundation for a ministry or another agency that is tracking access to be able to ask for the data uh, that they require for. So for example, having a, a mandate from the government to collect this data, but also if there are some policies and laws to enforce data collection, like for example, that all the electricity suppliers are required to provide connection data to the ministry or to the energy regulator, et cetera. This helps a lot in making sure these companies uh, works in the data exchange process. Of course, as I said before, establishing a data working group and including data providers is already a very good step because the data providers will be part of the discussion and will feel like this is also their projects. It's not just they are receiving uh, uh, some requests of data, etc. But then the legal foundation are key. As you have seen in many countries, the countries that have a strong legal foundation for data collection, they achieve to produce uh, much, much better data than countries that uh, are lacking today this. Second is defining a clear plan for the data world. This means that all the stakeholders that we identified should agree on a realistic timeline and scope for the data work. On the data collection tools, for example, well, do we use an Excel questionnaire to, that we send to the utility? They will send our back or we put in place an online platform where utilities automatically submit us uh, data on new connections, etc. And also what are the disaggregation of the data? Like, like uh, this can be done gradually. We start, uh, for example, national level, then the utility needs to start providing data 
based on geographical definition, for example, by jurisdiction, by region, etc. This also inquire, uh, require, sorry, uh, agreeing on uh, and writing down documentation procedures to perform these tasks, having an agenda like uh, a calendar of uh, data collection to data uh, dissemination and publication. The fourth principle is resources. We need to allocate financial, human, and IT resources to data collection because if there is no trained staff, if there is no money to do data projects, if there are no computers that are good enough for doing this work, there is no data. So resources need to be part of the plan and they need to be secured on a long term. Not only like for one year for a specific projects, it's better aiming for a long term engagement for a budget for data collection. Generally on energy, but also on access to electricity. And access to electricity can be part of the general country energy data strategy. So resources can be also uh, shared in there and make it more efficient. The fifth principle is training. We need to provide continuous training to the staff that work in our ministry or agencies that uh, process the data, continuous training, training to the data providers, to the data users, and to other statisticians. Training can be, for example, as participating today to a training provided by an international organization, but also internal training like of more senior staff that trains uh, junior people that arrive, uh, arrived in um, the ministry or the ministry itself that train data users in the utilities or in the energy distribution companies uh, on the data process. And to all these, like especially for training external uh, people, the first principle of having an established data working group is very key because it will very much facilitate all this exchange. Because also the utility ones can come to the ministry and train the ministry on their way they use data so the ministry best their understand of their challenges, what data are available, and together they can better uh, plan. And then last but not least is to always make improving data coverage and quality as a priority, not sit, sit down on, okay, now we are doing enough, we have a, a national access rate, but still with a working group plan to cover new and relevant indicators. So if there is new needs, and priorities, you might want to expand the data collection you're doing. You can aim to have a better geographical or technological disaggregation for your data, et cetera, et cetera. And now let's see how it looks like uh, the process of data working flow. Yeah, we design in the diagram, the national entity tracking access to electricity. And there are four main steps for data production, the data workflow. The first is data collection that is done in cooperation with data providers and external data providers that are not giving connection data, but maybe also sites or other relevant information. Then we have the data users on the other side that also provide input as we've seen before in our working group to know what data we want to collect, etc. Then we have data validation. This is an important step. When we receive or we collect data, we need to be sure these data are of good enough quality and there are no mistakes, errors, or problems in the data. So if any problems is spot, we need to go back to the data providers and uh, try to solve the issue and have uh, better uh, quality or more correct uh, data. After we have data processing, so all the raw data that is being collected are put together to create the indicators we are looking for, for example, the access rate. And again, at this stage, we can have further validation because when we calculate the access rate, we can see again that there are some problems uh, in the data we received. For example, an access rate of 120% in a specific area don't make sense. So we go back to look at the raw data and we can go back to the data providers if there are any problems. And last but not least, data dissemination. Once we have done all this work to ensure we have very good data, we need to make sure these data are easily available to the people that needs them for their work. And so we need to disseminate them properly. This can be in different forms, et cetera, and easily accessible, of course. 
At this stage, again, we can have other validation because, for example, a data users that receive or download the data from your website see something uh, that believe is not correct and can help also in improving the quality. So at this stage, so the data validation we see is very central. We are in a continuous uh, data improving uh, mode. Like once we find a mistake on the data validation process, but also at the other stages, we can still continue to uh, highlight or identify problems and so keep improving uh, our data. Here I'm showing the same, exactly the same process, but with more information. This is a figure that is in the guidebook. I don't think we need to go more in details here. It's very much the same we have seen before, but for example, when you look on data providers, we see what they include. We see from supply side, we have electric utilities, energy regulators, electrification agency, industry association, uh, energy distributors. And from the demand side, we have also service censuses. So for example, national, national statistic offices, et cetera. Then for data collection, uh, we put down some steps to establish data collection from the methodologies, definitions that are, for example, the one that we are proposing in this guidebook that we publish, what is the framework, et cetera, et cetera. I let you uh, take the time to look at uh, this diagram and all the text that goes with in the published guidebook, because today we want to see a big overview of everything. We don't want to focus only on the process. So let's start now with the first step, the data collection. And let's go to see what we need to collect. What we want to collect at first is connection. So we want to count how many households are connected through grid, mini grids and standalone systems. That meets our definition of minimum energy service as we have seen before. For grid, what are the main sources that we have seen many times are electricity distribution companies, energy regulators and others. What are the challenges for grid uh, data and connection? Once is their informal connection, so households that are uh, connected but not officially, submetering, or backup supply. So when there are households that are using two different types of connection. What, what you can do for going farther on grid connection, we can look at the level of consumption. For example, utilities know through billing data how much uh, households are consuming. For example, they know the number of households in different consumption tiers, how many households are in the social tariff, for example, that goes up to, I don't know, uh, 100 uh, kilowatt hours uh, per month or 50 kilowatt hours per month, depending on the country. And so they know, for example, uh, X uh, thousands of households consume less than 50 kilowatt hours per month. X number consume between X kilowatt hours and X kilowatt hours. This is a very important information, the level of consumption, because can help in uh, estimating uh, potential demand of a new connection, so make easier planning for uh, uh, for the future electrification. The geolocation of customers where households are uh, located that are connected. Many electric distribution company knows that already. They just need to process the data better to make them usable. Sometimes they just know where is the node or which village is connected. Sometimes they know like uh, more information on this, especially now that or in countries or in regions or areas of the countries where meters and smart meters are taking more uh, share of the connection. But this is still a slow process, the smart meter. So now we need to rely on other kind of information. We can work on affordability. So knowing the tariffs, how much uh, the kilowatt hour cost versus the income of households in this region that can be provided by other agencies in the government. And also look at the quality of supply through already existing indicators like the SIFI, the SIDI, and others that gives you, give us an idea of, for example, how many hours per day electricity is available, how many cuts, how long they are, et cetera, et cetera. For mini grids, who are the sources of data? For mini grids, we have uh, licensing authorities. This will be the best approach. So if the country have a licensing process, for example, the energy regulator that needs to validate a mini grid, this entity can track all the mini grids that have been licensed. But it's important also that this 
regulator or uh, licensing authority keep track of who, who uh, which mini grids are still active because if we keep track only on when they've been licensed but we don't know if they're still operating we can't come on uh, counting issues then there are the mini grid operators themselves so in some counties there are not many mini grid operators so directly discussing with them can also be interesting because they can provide also the number of people also they they are connecting donors if they have programs or other programs that the governments are launching with mini grids industry associations and other the challenges are a bit similar to to grids but the most uh, important one i think is the non-operational mini grids as uh, many countries some mini grids have been uh put in operation and some years after are no more operating for different issues or bad uh, planning or that was not considered before and uh the operation and maintenance of the mini grid or that uh, the income from the mini grids were overestimated and this come back to knowing how much we expect that the re, uh, this, the, the, the sales of electricity will be from, for example, the level of consumption can help in better sizing a mini grid, so making it more profitable and no lose operation. Then we have double counting, of course, some metering, etc. And for going further, again, we can track geolocation for mini grids. It will be easier because we know we can easier know where the mini grid is located. And normally, mini grids lines don't go very far. So, if we know already where the mini grids is located, is already a good information in knowing more or less where the customers are uh, located. We have the level of consumption, of course, that we know from metering and building. And again, affordability as for grid. Important to note again is that what we want to know is residential connection. Sometimes, grids or mini grids operators can provide the total number of customers. But what we want to know for tracking access to electricity in this case is the number of households that are connected. So we need to ask for this and most operators know. For standalone systems, again, we can have a licensing authorities that license standalone system operators or solar system distributors, for example, to operate in the country. And what we suggest and propose in the guidebook is that these licensing authorities work with the government to put in place some regulations that uh, requires these companies to also submit data on their number of customers or sales of systems in order to operate in the countries. So this uh, will be in the ideal case or something for the medium term where we establish this licensing framework and then the licensing authority can directly collect the data with a legal framework. So requiring the companies that are licensed to operate in the country to also provide the data. Then we have the companies themselves, but sometimes the, in some countries, the landscape can become very crowded with many companies, so it's being complicated. It can become complicated, and we have industry associations. What are the challenges for solar on system and standalone system in general? Are the boundaries, so which products we include? What is the minimum sites that provide the minimum energy services? In the guidebook, we've tried to select which are the products that can provide the minimum level of energy services we propose in the guidebook, that is the basic bundle of the IA. And for example, in the case of solar system, this is the system that have at least 10 watt peak, so they can provide lighting, phone charging, and a radio. Other challenges are the backup use, the free market, like the companies that are selling directly to companies, repeat sales, so also that are buying more than one uh, standalone system, and end of life. Because if you just keep track of sales, you need to know that these systems don't last more than five years especially the solar systems. And so at a point, they will be no more operative and they need to be discounted. But the, I think the most important issues here are the backup use that in some countries, the backup use of solar system is very, very big to, because the grid in many urban areas is not very reliable. So many households are buying solar systems uh, to keep continuity of the service. And since this number is very big, if we count, if you double count the you, the solar system and the grid connection, we will will be starting having uh, some errors in our uh, data. And going forward again, we can try to track geolocation. This is easy for, for example, paygo contracts when uh, where the uh, solar system companies knows where the system is located because they track 
the consumption of the households and they they charge them every period with some uh, they charge every period and they can also stop remotely the system if the household don't pay but for the sales is more difficult because once an household bought when a customer go buying a system if it's installed directly by if it's not installed by distribution company knowing where the system is it's more complicated then the level of supply so this is come from the sites of system keeping track of ranges of sites of the systems that are in operation is very important to know what are the level of services that households are receiving of course on 100 watt peak solar system provide much more services than a 10 watt peak system this 10 times smaller and then affordability of course keeping track of the cost of these systems uh, for paygo what are the installments that uh, households uh, needs to pay but let's see some of the problems we just mentioned with uh, some diagrams up here we can see grid informal connections as you can see some people are connected officially to the grid while some other can be connected informally informally can mean illegally like they really go to the to the distribution line and and put their cable they go to their house and use the electricity or informally they connect through another households directly so the grid company will not see them as customers and so they cannot know uh, if they are connected the recommended approach that uh, we could take is to exclude the informal and legal connection and work on policies and programs to ensure every household can be connected officially and formally. So, for example, reducing or incentivizing uh, the connection fee, as many countries are doing. For example, Ivory Coast is providing a uh, small monthly fee for the connection fee instead of a one upfront cost installment for the household. Uh, so spreading the cost over time is uh, proving that making effort more affordable to pay this over time than only one time is increasing the number of households that are officially connected. To, to, to solve this problem and so survey data can be used alongside, for example, the non-technical losses from the utility. So knowing how much electricity we are losing that is not coming from technical uh, issues or technical uh, losses, for example, as uh, lost as heat in the, in the lines. And this can give an idea of how much energy is, for example, stolen or is not paid for. Then we have some metering. That is when a, uh, an household or a small company provide or a landlord provide uh, some metering to other households. In many cases, in this, this situation, the grid, connect, the grid company only know of the main uh, household connected or, uh, or the main meter. And then this meter is split in different households by other service providers that can be private or, or not. And this makes that we are missing some connections that are happening in reality. So these households are connected, but the uh, the grid company data are not taking them into account. So how can we do that? The best approach will be to legally legally requiring the providers of sub submetting services to report this number of connections to the utility. But also, as in this case, also service are very helpful to estimate what is the real number of households connected to the grid as compared to what the grid is reporting. And then we have double county connection. I've seen before, we can have also connected to the grid. They use, for example, solar on system as backup. Or we have also that have multiple uh, standalone system. For example, they have a generator, they have a solar on system, or they have two solar on systems, et cetera, et cetera. Here as well, we can recover, we could try to require distributors of standalone system to collect data from their customers. So when they sell, they can ask, is this for your primary energy use or it is for backup energy use? And also here again, survey, we see again that surveys are important to calibrate supply side data, can help estimate a discount factor for a specific country or our area to understand what is the backup use of, uh, for example, solar system. This is just an example. We have seen from some publication from some uh, peer agencies that this number can change 
from uh, 70% to 3% only. So there is no standard default value you can use for backup use. You need one that is representative of the different areas of your country. Let's see now a bit how to estimate standalone system connection or solar on system connections. We have two type of connection, one that is coming from electrification programs from the government and one that is happening in the free market. And then we have PAYGO contracts that as I explained before is uh, selling a service practically. They, uh, and another one is the di direct sales of direct distribution of a system. So an household buy a system or uh, the program just provide directly uh, a solar system to the household. Why the PAYGO contracts is when there are monthly installments that the household pays uh, for using the solar system. Under electrification programs for PAYGO contracts, what we need to collect is the active customers contracts and these require companies to periodically report the number of active customers. Uh, okay, so this can be written in tenders. For example, when you do a tender for the electrification programs, you can require already uh, the solar system companies that they will need over time to provide how many people are still connected. For example, in the next uh, 10 years, every month you need to tell uh, the ministry how many people are connected in uh, the villages that are covered by this specific uh, procurement or tender. Then we have under electrification program, direct sales and distribution. And here we need to discount the systems that are no more operative. So we'll need either in the best case scenario to require a periodic verifications of systems that are still in operation. So like having some third parties going to the uh, a sample of the household that they received uh, the solar system and verify that these are still operative. And the best practice will be to include in the electrification program, operation and maintenance. So there will be someone going to the household that has been provided with access to also provide operation and maintenance services. And at the same time, so tracking if the system is still operative or not. If we include that in the electrification plan and the service and the tenders, we know that we are planning for a more sustainable electrification because we've seen in many cases when you just give for free a solar systems, sometimes the household either stop using it uh, over time or sell it to someone else, maybe that uh, in the urban areas that are already uh, uh, connected to the grid for the CAPU, so you lose this. But if you plan for operation and maintenance, you also ensure that this also will have a long-term access to electricity. And the same can be said for PAYGO contracts under electrification program. If you plan for a long-term electricity provision to the household, instead of just, uh, a new connection, you will get more results, more long lasting results. Then we have the free market that of course is more complicated to track active customers. The best solution will be to create a licensing, licensing framework as you've seen for companies and requiring them to report active customers. This is easy for PAYGO contracts as you've seen because the company knows who are the households that are still paying them so that they have an active solar on system. But for the free market and direct sales, is more complicated. So again, we need to discount and estimate the systems that are no more operative. But how do we do this discounting when it's needed to be now? First of all, we need to discount for the end of life. We need to use an assumed lifetime for the different type of products. For example, for solar home systems of 10 watt and above, we can estimate that they will have a lifetime or more or less five years or less, depending on what are our uh, information. Then we need to discount for the backup use. This is very important, we've seen before. This is especially true in areas, in urban areas, for example. And as I said before, it changed a lot depending on areas, jurisdiction, countries. So it needs to be based on uh, specific information. And then a discount factor for repeat sales as well. This is less important than the other two, but still needs to be estimated. In the IA template that uh, most of you received, with which we recover and collect the data from your country, there is a small tool built in that permits you to discount for the end of life and for backup use. 
So we just need to enter what is your estimated lifetime for the specific product. You enter the sales year by year. And then the uh, tool estimate how many systems are still in operation in each year. You can also enter a backup use, so the percentage of systems that are sold that are used for backup if you have this information. And so this tool also correct for this and we provide you the number of systems that are operative and so the number of operative connection to solar home systems. Now we finish the data collection side, let's go to see a quick overview of data validation. So the step before, how we ensure data are uh, of quality. First of all, we have four type of data validation checks. One is validating and checking coverage and definitions. The second one is internal coherence. We have consistency with other sources. And last but not least, plausibility. But let's start with the coverage and definition. Under that, we have different kind of uh, checks that we can perform. One is boundary and perimeter that verify that connection data includes only, for example, the residential sectors, or other boundaries can be that we include only the systems that can provide a minimal level of energy services that we define on our tracking. For example, for the IA, if you're speaking of the basic bundle uh, minimum service, we'll need at, at least a 10 watt peak solar on system. The smaller system will not be included in the access rate. The time frame is correct, is exactly the year we are counting. Are the units correct? For example, I received uh, connection are in millions, thousands, uh, am I using correctly? And also geographically, is this uh, for the national level, is it for a jurisdiction, for a village, and is exactly what I'm using it for. Here an example of uh, uh, coverage definition checks. If we receive connections from a utility and uh, we have total connection, we need to be sure that we include only the residential connection, so the blue here. So we need to further ask uh, the utility to provide only residential customers and not all customers. Internal coherence uh, checks. What are internal coherence uh, checks? Verify relationships among data. This can be, for example, arithmetic check that verify the data all adds up to totals. For example, verifying that total connection are equal to the sum of connection by type. For example, grid plus mini grid plus standalone is equal to total connection or by area, for example, rural and urban, the sum of rural plus urban connections are equal to the national connections. And then we have time series checks that, for example, ensure that there are no discontinuities in the data, no breaks in the time series that are not uh, justified by something that happened. And here we have a quick example that is also in the guidebook where you can see, for example, that uh, in 2022, the sum of rural and urban is not the same as national. You, know, you can see in the violet dot up there. And also we can see that there is a big break in the time series for rural connections. So what needs to be done here is first verify that this break in the time series in rural connection is justified, or if it's just a wrong data manipulation. If it's justified, for example, it could be a big program on solar on systems, that in 2022 delivered a lot of uh, households with access. And in this case, also the national connection need to be corrected accordingly. But if the problem was in the time series, rural connection need to be corrected, et cetera, et cetera. So spotting errors is the important part here in internal coherence. The consistent with external sources, this is very important a check because ensure that the data collected are in line with other comparable data from other sources. For example, the IA access to electricity data differs from the World Bank one because we use different sources and methodology, but we know that. So we can compare them knowing that there are specific differences and so being able to, to, to know if there is a difference that cannot be, difference that cannot be justified. Then we have as you can see here is the difference between the IA access rates with the World Bank access rate for different Af African countries that are represented by the blue dots. And then we have the plausibility checks that ensure that the final data are in line with reality. So this can range from checking obvious things like uh, 
simple like uh, reality checks, like is the access rate higher than 0% and lower than 100% or can be more nuanced evaluations that rely on uh, the data checker or the expert knowledge of the sectors. Examples are confirming there are non-negative values in access rate, as I said, or verify that access rate are not higher than 100%, but also that reported, for example, reported zeros are reality. If we have zero connections in, uh, in for example, in uh, Solarum system, is this true or is it just that we don't have the data? In the case we don't have the data, instead of reporting zero, we can have a qualifier that tells us that these data are not available or a metadata or the documentation that go with the data that will tell these data doesn't include standalone systems that are not available at the moment. For example, this will help a lot data users. And let's verify the data falls in expected ranges. For example, if there has been a very strong uh, electrification program in the latest year, are we seeing the access rate increasing? And if not, why is it correct? Is the program that is not effective or is the data that is not uh, effectively tracking access? So once we do the verification, once we spot mistakes, we always go back to the raw data source and contacts and we try to work with the data providers to find solutions. Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's more complicated and some mistakes might be left to be solved for next year. Some will require quick estimation for this year and uh, uh, more solid solution for, for later. But always keep track of all mistakes, how it's been solved, et cetera, to have a good log of uh, documentation. Then let's go to the data processing part. How we process the data. Let's see the example of calculating the access rate. We count connection, as you've seen here in the figure in blue. We estimate how many people are connected in each household. So we multiply, for example, the household sites by the number of connections. The best it will be done by area. If we know the household sites by a different area and we have the connection by the same areas, we can use this. Because as we know, in some more remote areas of the countries, there can be a very different household site. So this can make a difference when you calculate the access rate. And then calculate the access rate by dividing the total connected population by the total population. Many countries uh, use a basic formula, but the IA has uh, proposed in the guidebook a recommended formula that practically uh, proposed the principle of calculating access to electricity indicators by technology and geographical areas. The recommended formulas calculate the access rates of bottom-up by location and by system, and can also provide the access rate by system. You can see in this example, we can see grid, mini grid, and uh, so, uh, standalone system connection by different areas, for example, the east region, the west region. And then we have the total by the region, the total connection in the east region, the total connection in the west region, and also the national total. The collected, once the connection will be connected, collected, sorry, by technology and area, if we multiply them by the household sites of the area, we obtain the population with access, as we've seen before. So how many people are connected to grid here in this example? Then if we divide this by the total population data that are probably coming from the National Statistics Office, we obtain the access rate in this region. And we can see that we can do that for, uh, for each region and each, uh, and each area each area and each uh, technology as for example, this 8% of standalone system in the West region. Then we can go and bottom up calculate uh, regional totals and national totals. To calculate, it's better not to use at the national level, for example, the average household sites, but since we collected the data bottom up, it's better to use directly the total population with access that we estimated uh, bottom up before. And so we left, for example, in this example, 38 million. Then we can divide by the population at the national uh, access rate. And of course, we can do this for each uh, technology at the national level, for each technology 
uh, for each area uh, in the country. We can also use uh, definition of areas instead of uh, geographical uh, location as rural and urban, but this will where we require like to have a strong definition of rural and urban, and that also data providers align to this definition of rural and urban when they collect, uh, process, and provide you uh, the information on the connections. And now let's go to the last uh, part of uh, the data workflow, that is the data dissemination. Data dissemination, as you've seen, is when we publish the data, okay? We have the first principle is the data need to be relevant when, when we publish, accurate and timely. What does it mean? In terms of relevance, this means that the entity in charge of tracking access need to align the data production and dissemination to the evolving needs of the data users. For example, including a split of technology when it's needed. And that's is ensuring that the data are reproducing reality on the ground with a good degree of accuracy and reliability. And this is very important to implement, as we've seen before, verification and revision of the data procedures to make sure the data we publish are in line with reality. Then we have timeliness as well. So it's very important that the data are available on time and they're up to date to make sure that the users can use the best and more recent data available on their uh, analysis and tracking of uh, the effectiveness of uh, access rate. For example, you know, some countries that are present today, like uh, for example, Mozambique and Rwanda, uh, are able to produce uh, very timely data for their data users that go beyond the annual uh, level. Then we have accessibility and clarity of the data. This is very important. If we publish very good data that are relevant, accurate, and timeliness, but no one can find them because they are nowhere <laughs> outside of the uh, ministry servers, or they are hidden in a website that are very difficult to access, access this is a problem because no one will benefit from this very important hard work. So after creating quality data, we need to make them available and accessible to all users. For this reason, we recommend that there are clear release calendars so we know when data will be published, where will it be published, and how we can access the data. For some more disaggregated data, for example, there is a need of requiring uh, a profile to be subscribed or the access be restricted only to specific uh, entities or uh, people. But in general, it's very good to have this data and the persons, at least the more important data users, to know when the data will be released and where, but also to the most large public to have some data available for free and easily that are maybe more aggregated. Data can be and must be released in different uh, forms to be more clear, for example, uh, different formats like Excel databases. They can be also in reports that have graphs and uh, figures in tables, etc. But in general, a combination of all these different uh, formats is the best because they can convene for different users. There are some users that prefer or they need a report for their work. Some users that prefer to have a complete database in Excel or in other formats or from a web page, for example, that they can use for their analysis. So it's very important also to have different type of formats available. And then we have the last that is coherence, comparability, and transparency. So the use of uh, metadata. As we know, there is always difference how countries, regions, even companies inside the countries treat data. So it's very important that we keep track of data about data. This is called metadata. This is important because people will have then a transparent record of how this data may diverge from standards, for example, or why, or what they include. Like they include uh, all type of technologies, connection, et cetera, et cetera. Where the data is sourced, what are the sources are from surveys from a combination of service and supply data, only from supply data. We have good examples in the guidebook that you can look at, but publishing together with the data itself, documentation on uh, 
uh, how the data has been calculated, what are the methodology and definitions supplied can help a lot uh, data users. So release data must be accessible, relevant, and transparent. But now let's go back to some questions for you. And let's try to go back. Sorry, I think we lost the screen sharing, but I'll start it soon. Let's start again. Uh, Mentimeter. So let's go to menti.com.com. But now we need to use a different code. I leave you the time. So the code here is 49111595 that you can see at the top uh, of the shared screen now. I'll, I'll leave you the time to. I'll leave you the time to connect again and then uh, answer. The question is what is for you in your country the main barrier that you encounter for tracking access to electricity? Again, you can write down the things and we'll see the different uh, answers that we receive. So the code again is 4911. 1595. And the site is menti.com. Can go with your phone or not, but I see no one is uh, answering now. Maybe when we wait uh, uh, for people start answering that we see, uh, I can look at some of the questions and answers we have uh, we have had in the question and answer. Okay, there is a question on uh, mini grids, saying that since they have distribution lines, should this be considered as considered as grid connection? And uh, that's not is not by definition, since we, we are defining here grid and mini grid separately. Since mini grid often are separated from the national central grid that also include transmission lines. And we will count as grid connection only the ones that are part of this uh, bigger national uh, transmission grid. For mini grids, we count the mini grids if they have only distribution lines that are very uh, short distribution lines. Normally there is a, a uh, generation unit close to a village and the lines just go to the different households in the village. There are no long transmission lines. So this is why we separate them. Sometimes when the grid arrives connects to the mini grid, so the challenge arrives there. Do we count this as grid or as mini grid? And as I tried to show before is that in this case, we need to track the connection as coming from the entity or the company that is selling officially the, uh, the electricity. So it's still the mini grid operator is selling the electricity. We can say this connection is mini grid, but if this is the grid taking over the distribution business, we can count this as a uh, grid uh, connection. However, it's important to track also how many mini grids are connected to the grid because this is very key. There is also a question on how the IA can help in uh, improving uh, access uh, to literacy tracking from our colleagues in uh, Zambia. The thing that we can do actually is more on the training side. We provide many trainings and also not only this workshop, but we'll have some more in-depth training happening uh, this year. And also again, there is a training happening in Italy uh, in July. We have a, a small number of participants that can participate, but we uh, ask you to please send your application because we'll consider all of you and we'll give priority to the motivation of people, to the relevant of their position if they really work on tracking access, et cetera. And also we'll need uh, to give priority to the countries and uh, people that 
are cooperating the most with us on the data collection process. And this will be, for example, a training that uh, we are looking for sponsorship and the uh, people that come will be sponsored to join this training. This is an occasion that, of course, will be for selected participants because uh, it's uh, live, but there will be many more things that will continue to organize uh, also after the summer, both online uh, and live as uh, times come. And that's so we can help your country raise the message of the importance of access to electricity data and so include it, for example, on uh, energy transition planning. And once an energy transition plan includes required resources for data development, this means that you can raise for uh, donors, for example, or for the government to put your, to give you more resources and budget to do that. Oop. So I think like many people already answered, we see that reliability is one of the most difficult things to track. Corruption, harmonization of data is a difficult thing. Then we see unreliability of the data. So this requires more, yeah, more data checking and more work. I see many of these problems can be solved in a medium term once we establish this data working group with all stakeholders and we work with them periodically to overcome all these problems like uh, unreliability of data, etc. Institutional setup, this is also very important, but again, the first, uh, let's say, fundamental uh, that we see for a data strategy that says to put together this uh, working group can also solve this because once you start speaking with all the entities working in the countries, we can achieve all this. Uh, availability data, analyze the data. Yeah, this uh, analyze the data means there is no time probably to analyze the data. It is time consuming, and then, and this uh, come back to to the reporting part. Uh, to the resources part, sorry, not the reporting part. Sorry, I got distracted. I was reading the, your question. This is very interesting. Uh, cloud of Word, actually, very happy. We have this. I will uh, take a picture. Location as well. Location this is very important because uh, knowing where the connection or the people that are getting access are is key and fundamental for planning. And many times we don't know that. We don't have facilities, etc. Then let's see another question. I think I have a last slide probably on the workshop itself. We didn't finish. We'll show quickly as, uh, some Excel templates after this, but we'd like to know from you if the workshop was useful, what additional content you would like to see in this kind of workshops or a future workshop, etc. Please, I let you I let you answer this and we'll start seeing all your feedback that will be taken, of course, into account for this. Feel free to have a positive feedback and negative feedback and what you will uh, like us uh, to cover on the next uh, workshop, etc. Positive feedbacks are very appreciated, but also constructive feedback, of course, because we want to make the most impact on this. Uh, there is an interesting question from uh, Kenya, for our colleagues, uh, about the fact that Kenya already have a national identification strategies. How can the data part can be integrated in an existing policy. That's unfortunately, I'm not an expert on uh, how this could work, but uh, if it's not possible to include it in the existing strategy, it's very important that the people that are uh, in charge of implementing the strategies rise the importance of tracking and establishing a uh, linked to the litification strategy, data strategy that can serve as a uh, back, uh, backbone to provide the information to the electrification strategies to track, uh, to, to monitor, and to also uh, plan again once we have seen after some years how trends have evolved, if we need to change direction, etc. So it's very important we raise this up 
and etc. But I fortunately I'm not able to tell you how you can integrate this in an existing uh, policy. But maybe we can have more discussion and see if we have some people from other countries that already have been able to implement some modification to an existing policy and they want to share their experience. Then I have a question on uh, the minimum energy service from uh, our colleagues, I think, in Ethiopia that are asking from tier one solar lantern products if they are considered electrific electrified households. So the IA propose that only the solar home systems that are of 10 watt peak and above are considered as access to electricity. Solar lanterns normally are smaller than three watt peak and they can provide only one light point. So we don't consider they provide the minimum basic bundle of service that we described. So we don't include it in the access rate. However, we suggest that this is struck separately. So you know the number of households that use solar lanterns because it's a big market and can provide an information of how many households are receiving, uh, let's say, more uh, quality lighting than uh, previously. But of course, it's not providing an energy service that is life-changing because as a one light point of the solar lanterns doesn't, it can permit, of course, uh, people to study at night when uh, light is uh, over, et cetera. So it changed also the quality, but still I feel, and the IA proposes in this case to exclude from access rate and not electrification, of course, but to count them separately. separately. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have already 15 uh, comments. We will read them uh, more uh, offline and come back uh, with proposals. But for example, in reading, how can we track access with GIS? Uh, we'll have sessions on this in the future. One will be the one uh, physically in, in Italy this summer that some of you will have the chance to attend. Please, if you didn't do uh, apply, to the training because uh, I'm sure you received the email for the application. If not, if you didn't receive uh, the information for applying, uh, feel free to contact us and we can make sure that you have the chance to apply. Uh, but as I said, there is a very short uh, number of people that will be able to attend. So we cannot unfortunately bring everyone to Italy this time, but there will be other trainings on this, even some on offline, on online, sorry, remotely. And we'll read all these uh interesting comments later so thank you very much let's go now to continue our uh, workshop we have uh, if you can stay at least uh, 20 30 minutes more we can finish today with our uh workshop i wanted now to show the ia template for tracking access to electricity so the IA template for tracking access to electricity, as some of you knows very well, looks like this. It's an Excel file with uh, a first page that includes instruction on how to use it and some definitions of the access the IA use. And then there are some information to fill. First thing to do since the, this template questionnaire includes macro is to enable content. If not, it will not work. So you'll have to click here up in the yellow uh, line, enable content, and then we go to fill the data after reading the instructions on how to fill it, to fill the, the first information here. So you choose your countries. Here I just put other English because Italy is not there. Then we write the name of the person that filled the question, Gianluca. And we can also put the institution, for example, is a very important information, even if normally we receive this by email, so we know already who we are, but the date. Oh, 23, <laughs> I'm still in 22. The data source, this is important. This is a, not an open question, but provide you, are you taking this from distribution companies, from household service or for both of them? So let's say we take it from both of them. Then the boundaries of Technology, do you include only grid connection, grid and mini grid, or all grid, mini grid, and standalone? Let's say we cover all of them. 
and then a brief description of uh, the definition you use, blah, blah, blah. You can even put a link to, for example, uh, metadata if you already have them, etc. We ask also a link to the national notification plan or other related documentation. If you don't have one, you can just put not available. The IA is not an notification plan. Your targets, you can put a link to the official targets or write down as, for example, our targets for notification is 100% uh, by 2030 in line with the SDG7, for example. And then we ask an open question to describe what we discussed before, the impacts of COVID and energy crisis on uh, electrification. After everything is filled, even if you cannot fill a portion, you can just write not available or not applicable, and then you click start. Once all the blue uh, cells are filled, you can click start and you go to the tables to be filled. Here we see we have four tabs. One is for the main data entry. One is for the secondary data entry that uh, is on uh, time series access rates. One is the tool for estimating a standalone system access. And one is for just doing your calculation, putting, uh, copying some data in and uh, putting links to your uh, sheets. The first, if you read the instruction, you will know that you can start here if you have data on connections. If you don't have any data on connection on 420, for the moment you have only the access tree directly, you can directly go in time series. But once you fill here, the time series will be filled. What do you need to fill here? So the number of connections in millions of households uh, by grid, meaning grid and different solar home system sizes for the different years. Then what we need to fill is the population. Normally, when we give you the question for your country, we prefill this population with the data we have at the IA, but you can uh, put your own population if you have different data and write in the comments, for example, why. Also, the comments is very important to write some information on the data you're providing. Then there is the also sites. Here we let you enter national and urban household sites to be used. And then the rural household sites is automatically calculated with uh, population data. And this will automatically cal calculate after with the formula that is here, the access rate by, by multiplying the connection by the household sites. So we give it as a population with access and divide it by the total population data that we entered or that are already entered. And this is done by technology, by area, and then at the total level. Once this is filled, as I say, will be also automatically filled in the other tab that just report more aggregated only the access rate in percentages. And if you don't have, as I say, connection data is written here as well in cell uh, you know, row two, you can fill directly time series. Uh, uh, with access rate. So for example, here you can say we are at 90% access rate. Okay. And normally when you have, uh, well, when we send you the questionnaire directly, we prefill also the last year data uh, from the IA, and you will see some differences from the previous year IA uh, data. So you can also connect on that, co uh, comment on that. Then there are some buttons that permit you to put the default values or uh, go back to different system. Once the question is filled, we'll provide you some graphs on the access rates. For example, if we had like 80% uh, grid, five 4% mini grid, and so on systems to have 90% to miss 6%. We'll also have some other graphs here. You see like a column of 
access rate by technology. And then the estimating tool for access with standalone systems, you can enter the lifetime you have for your system. That can be five, uh, six years, three years, depending on uh, what the information you have in the system that you provide is used. Five, five is a good uh, proxy for solar systems. Then you choose if you have information on the backup use. For example, let's say you know that 5% of the sold solar systems are used for backup to the grid in your country. And then you adjust to fill the sales of delivery. So how many units have been sold of these sites in, uh, in 2000? Let's say we sold uh, 1,000 units, then 5,000 in 2001, 500 only in 2002, 100,000 in 2003, and just uh, adding different numbers. 15,000, 10,000, 100. A lot in 2000, no, it's too much. As you can see below, the tool is already calculating the systems in operation, estimating them using the lifetime and the discount factors. Since we put a lifetime of five years, this means that the systems that have been sold in 2000, they will not be more available in 2005. And so on, 2001, they will not be more more available in 2006, and so on and so forth. So this permits you to just put the number of sales that is more easy to collect and to have a quick estimation of how many households have access to these systems. This is important because if we still keep into account system that has been uh, provided or sold uh, many years ago, we are probably overestimating our access rate. Uh, now, let me go quickly to the exercise that we'll send it to you in Excel form. And also we'll try to send you the solutions of this exercise that you can do uh, with uh, dummy data to, from with fake data to, uh, to train on filling the IA questionnaire. Let me just open it because I have not opened it yet. And then I will share it and quickly explain it, but we'll send, as I say, the exercise uh, and we are planning also to record the solutions to have a step by step on how to solve it and this will be also very helpful to fill in the questionnaires in next iterations that we might have in the future so okay. still a couple of minutes and i am coming Here we are. So the exercise that you see here is an Excel file. There is a tab start here where we explain the exercise. You are in charge of traffic access to in your country. You have some data sets provided in the tab, the blue tabs, grid data, mini grid data, certain systems. Uh, you need to use this data to fill the IA questions that is here in red. So for grid data, you have uh, free distribution companies that provides you different data. There will be some problems and some questions to, uh, to answer as well. The questions that you answer will help you uh, solve then the, uh, the exercise because our questions they make you reason on what are the issues that are happening here. The same thing is for mini grid. You see, for example, here a problem is that the company VAT didn't provide the units. So what we need to do, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, and there are other, other tricky, tricky parts. Therefore, mini grids, similar. You have uh, different information. Some are coming from the energy regulators. But then when you go through the exercise, you can ask data to the mini grid operators and have more in interesting data to fill your questionnaires. But if you go through the different guiding questions, this will be easier. Similarly for solar on systems, you have a lot of data here that you will use to fill the IA questions by also using the tool that is built in in the question that we have seen just before. And then you have additional data that are just the population and the national household sites. This exercise is, the, is at the national level, so it's simplified, but I think it, include some uh, challenges that you might encounter 
tracking access to electricity. And also will make you familiarize with the IA questionnaire. And so to not only submit the data to the IA, but also use it eventually as a tool for your own uh, access to electricity uh, indicators calculation. I'll, uh, I think I stop it here to, today. If you have any other question, please uh, write them in the chat. So maybe we can have uh, the last, uh, the last uh, exchange and then we can close it up and please keep in touch by email, by the WhatsApp group. If you are not yet part from the WhatsApp group, please send us an email, we'll provide you the link because in this group, we'll provide more information on a coming training or a coming uh, publications from the AA, but also you can share with the other colleagues all, these, uh, all, all the work you're doing, uh, challenges you have. For example, you can ask a question, is someone already resolved the challenge of uh, implementing a data strategy, blah, blah, blah. So I have uh, two questions yet to answer. How to join the July 2023 activity? So to join that, we need to apply. Uh, I don't know if you received the email, but please send an email to myself or to known, and we will make sure uh, that you have the information to apply. As I said, unfortunately, uh, the number is uh, limited. The slides will be shared, of course, after the presentation, and also we'll share the video recording. We'll put this video on YouTube, and you'll have the occasion to watch it again or to share it uh, with your colleagues so they can also uh, benefit, benefit from this discussion that we had today. We'll also share the exercise, as I said before. Thank you, Leonard, for asking for the slides to be given in advance. Unfortunately, I had to finish the slides last minute because uh, it was a uh, bank holidays in France. So I didn't have the slides finalized uh, before, but this is a very good comment. But anyway, we'll send the slides in PDF format together with the video, et cetera, to all participants in the coming days or week, whenever we are ready uh, to do that. Thank you very much. Let's keep in touch. And uh, very happy of the big participations that we have uh, had today. Uh, the work you're doing is very important on tracking access to electricity. And uh, please let's work together to find a, a better technical solution, but also try to look on how we can support you trying to find uh, the best uh, support from your uh, ministries and uh, country agencies. Thank you very much, everyone.